least four or five easy payments <laughs> of whatever, $29.95 or whatever it is. How come the payments are always easy? Easy for them. Easy for them to receive, you mean? Yeah. It's easy for them to receive your... Receive it, put four, it on the accounts and put it in the bank. Four easy payments, yeah. yeah. And then they vanish. If the product is uh, investigated and it's fake, they, they vanish, they, you, you, the P.O. box is gone, <laughs> and then they come back with another product under another name. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, let us, oh by the way, do you feel a tad bit warm or are you okay? No, why? You feel comfortable? Yeah, why? Oh, because you got the thermostat on our central I air. I have it on 74. Oh, good. Central air conditioning on 74. No wonder I'm a little, I'm a little sweaty. All right. It's 74. You shouldn't. It's blowing right on you. It's blowing right on me, brother. Okay. Um, when I get up, maybe I'll and, put it uh, on 73. Cameraman, camera, camera person, is everything okay? The, oh. the red dot is on. Everything look okay? Uh, yeah. The magical red dot that everything is fine. Great, great. Red dot. That's okay. Orange dot. Uh, okay. Let us sink our teeth into these readings. The other day, I was having some words with some people. I always have words with some people. Certain people. Now, the people involved uh, had an idea yeah. of what they wanted to defend and they did so. Now this doesn't just involve like one person or whatever. This involves the Supreme Court of the United States also. Oh. Because they too have an idea. But they are supposed to obey the Constitution. Hopefully. Well, they don't. Now, let me read exactly what the Constitution says about this subject. Exactly. And the subject is the Second Amendment. The right to bear arms. Oh, boy. Now, this is a quote from the Constitution of the United States. Quote. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Yes, I hear you. Okay, so now where, where does that as the Supreme Court has said, that uh, is a right to bear arms per se. The Constitution is saying, yeah, you got a right to bear arms, but you are also in a militia, and a militia either is uh, fighting for the state or fighting for the national government. So yeah, when you come for a meeting, you bring your gun. Now, in and case when you go home, it, yeah. You hang your gun up on the wall. Over your fireplace. Over your fireplace. If you have a fireplace. Unless you're going hunting. Well, uh, I was just or gonna, defending yourself. I was just gonna say, if there's a problem with an American citizen getting a permit for a gun that's meant to kill people. There ain't no problem. If there's a problem, well, under Republicans and the <laughs> NRA, there won't be a problem. Uh, but if there is ever a problem, you just you just buy a hunting rifle or shotgun. If you want, look, a 12-gauge shotgun is extremely effective at defending your home. You know, in a case of uh, martial law, you know, yeah, and, 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 and people are running around looting and there's burglaries. You, you but just, here's, here's the issue. Pump some double O buck into them. Here's the issue that the Supreme or slug, Court or slug that the Supreme yeah. Court did not recognize, and individuals do not recognize, because they believe that the right to bear arms in the Second Amendment is clearly stating that you have this right, 
to go against your government if, if it becomes a tyranny. Which, it, which it's becoming. Huh? It's not a tyranny. Not yet. It's fascism. But that doesn't give you a right to go out there with your gun and kill cops like this lady and guy did the other day. The point I'm making... Yeah, and, 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 and people... The point I'm making is so, that's not how the Second Amendment was written. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay. And, 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 and innocent whites, white people, elderly whites, a World War II veteran out in the West Coast, uh, just randomly selected and, and murdered. But those are individual because problems. Because of ever those since are the, social problems. Ever since the Zimmerman case. Uh, Mental innocent, illness problems. Innocent people, no, no, it's more than What that. do they have to do innocent with the Second people, Amendment? Innocent people are targeted. Well, what did that have to do with the Second Amendment? Because That's my point entirely. No, you, you're talking about the Second Amendment. That's correct, but they, these things that you're well, talking about are problems. They're social problems, they're mental problems, yeah. they're this, that, and the right, other thing. Right, exactly. Problems. They have nothing to do, you know, with the uh, Second Amendment, per se. Right. But the point is that the conservatives will tell you, we need the right to bear arms because we have to protect ourselves from the government. They are the government! They own the House of Representatives! And, 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 and they have the opportunity to vote out the government leaders come election time. Get their asses to the polls. Make it your business to get to the polls. It was pathetic, uh, uh, the percentage of Americans that end up going to the polls and voting. It's so tiny. And now they want, to, they want to make that even tinier. Then they have no <laughs> right to complain. Look, an old Jewish guy told me back in the 1980s. Hey. He, had, he had an accent like this. James, you, if you, did you vote? Well, I was young. I didn't think about voting. Oh, well, of course not. I, I, I should have been more responsible. Than, you have no right to complain. You have no right to complain if you don't vote. And he's right. Well, you if do you don't vote, right. don't complain. You do have a right to complain because... But, but your duty to vote. Is, yeah, but the fact of the matter is, people evolve at different points. For instance... Get your ass to the polls. Don't listen to what he just says. Get your ass yes, to the today. polls and vote, 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 vote. But most people... Don't be lazy. Until it happens to them, they do not move. I know... Same with some sort of catastrophic illness or something. I know somebody. I know somebody who used to be really right-wing and pro... 100% pro-corporate and, uh, and... And who, who used to say, well, you either work for minimum wage or you don't... You don't work. You don't have an income at all. That's right. And you, and you die, you know. Yeah. I used to know somebody like that. But that person became financially destitute and became liberal, progressive liberal, awfully quick. Became when liberal, but the problem ran is... Ran out of moolah. The yeah. problem is that there were signs and, and instances and stuff that that person should have been aware of, you know, a long time ago, to understand that there's something going on beyond his control that is making the economics of this country and the morality of rigged. this country it's all, rigged. all rigged. Correct. And, and a lot of people just say, oh, how terrible uh, human nature is. No, there's no love in their hearts. There's no compassion. There's no empathy. It's rigged. It's rigged. Deliberately it's rigged. It's rigged. It's deliberately it's rigged. rigged. But, like I say, people come to these uh, epiphanies, you know, at different times. And that's why a show like this is important. Because it gives the information that the person ain't getting now so that he can digest it, you know, assimilate it, eat it up, and then start making some decisions. You know, I was a late bloomer. Uh, I did not become enlightened until later in life. See, 
it wasn't my time to Correct. become enlightened. When, when, when I first met you, I did not have the enlightenment and knowledge about what's really going on like I do today. Well, it's the same thing with schooling or something like that. My personal, my personal example is that I, I'm, maybe in my early years I didn't, but later on through school, up until 1963, mm -hmm. graduation time, I couldn't have cared less. I couldn't have cared less. But in 1963, when I graduated, I had an epiphany. And the epiphany drove me to the library every week. And I devoured books, periodicals and stuff, according to my five taboos of American life. Very studious man, uh, Dr. Bill. Is studious? Not stupidious. Yeah. I said stu studious. Studious and, and focused. Very focused, like Mr. Miyagi told Daniel san You are very focused. Well, that's what it's all about. Or this, this uh, Philippine science professor I used to know used to say, fuck us. You need to fuck us. I go, excuse me? <laughs> what did you say? I need to fuck? No, fuck us. She was trying to say focus. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> Bless her little heart. Bless her little heart. Uh, moving right along. Moving right along. You know how the uh, we learn about history and things of that nature. We we tend to think in terms of hey, General Dwight D. Eisenhower won the war, World War Two, or uh, uh, George Washington won the war single-handedly. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. I mean, we think of Napoleon. We think of history in terms of the great man. Great man? The great because man. they were a dictator that wanted to conquer the world and kill people? Yeah, it's the same thing like with the king. You know, only... The great man? Only like the, uh, the early kings and everything, they went out and they fought with their men. After that, they sat on their asses while the men fought. They sat on their asses on their thrones yeah. in the castle drinking ale and uh, different intoxicating liquors. My point entirely is that public, history yeah. is made by the populace, not by the great man. He gets the credit. Yeah. But it is the people who make history. Case in point. Take the common tale of Paul Revere. His midnight ride. What a guy, eh? I know somebody better who, who wasn't nearly nearly as famous as Paul Revere. It was a young teenage girl who rode to warn we people. We will get to that, please. The, you, I'm already you, ahead of have you. Have you heard that shit about that yes. the chick? She, and she never made... 16 years old. That's right. Thank that's you. right. All right. I'm sorry. Continue. But contrary to the storybook version, his ride was not a spur-of-the-moment act by an impetuous revolutionary hero. Nor did Paul Revere ride alone. Single-handedly dashing through every Middlesex village and farm to alert the slumbering masses. As Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said in his poem, here's another important tidbit the adulators leave out. Paul was a woman. The, yeah, the one who really wrote. Wait till you hear this. Revere was a prosperous, politically connected industrialist, hobnobbed with Sam Adams, John Hancock, and the other Massachusetts leaders of the Revolution. Far from being an impromptu, individualistic act, his now legendary ride of April the 18th, 1775, was one part of an intricate alarm muster. 
a web that settlers and the militia had used since early colonial days. Their network included dozens of express riders, special horses, church bells, drum riffs, gunshots, trumpet blasts, and beacon fires. But of course, the hoity-toity Paul Revere had to take credit for it all. Well, he didn't do that. That's what I'm saying. It was a a, a, a Henry Wadsworth Longfellow who did that with his stupid poem. And we do that with the George Washington and with the, the other ones. That's the whole point. We make them the heroes. I don't even know if George Washington ever chopped down a cherry tree. He didn't. That was a lie. It's a lie! It's a lie! It's a, it's a fish story. It's a tall tale. <laughs> Well, he, he probably really did have wooden dentures, though. He had wooden dentures. That's correct. Yeah. Months before Revere's famous moment of action, the Revolutionary Congress had chosen him to make sure this system was in place all around Boston and ready to go. By preparing in advance, the movement's spies, signalers, and riders were able to spring immediately into action on that fateful night when the Redcoats first stepped from their Boston encampment to march on Lexington and Concord. Revere had positioned himself across the Charles River with his horse already saddled. A fast mare named Black Beauty. Really? Yeah. That was the first Black Beauty or the Black Beauty? Well, I guess that's the V. Lent to him specifically for his journey by Deacon John Larkin. His assignment was to ride to Lexington to warn Adams and Hancock that the British were coming to capture them. By the way, Revere did not shout. The British are coming as he galloped down the road. His was a stealth mission. So shouting was a no-no. No, it just sounds better for, for story writing to be yeah. more dramatic. Exactly. Now, this young lady... We're getting there! Okay. Oh, you pause. I thought you were done. Nor did he knock on every farm door. Rather, he awakened key militia leaders. Get the term militia? Yeah. And militia fought for the Massachusetts. At the State militia. At the time, it was the priority was Massachusetts. At the time. Revere's ride most certainly was courageous and historic, but So were the rides of more than 60 other men, and yes, women, who also were alarm messengers assigned different routes that night. By 5 in the morning on the 19th, Patriot militias from most of the communities 50 miles around Boston were on the move to Lexington and Concord well ahead of the bumbling and foundering British. I, I stood in a hotel one time in uh, Lexington, Lexington, Mass. I was there, I, I, wrote, I went to Concord. I didn't see any Concord grapes anywhere. You know, Welch's grape, ju grape ju jam. All right, go ahead. The British were routed in this opening military battle of our independence war. The victory was not sparked by a lone ranger, but by an organized insurgency of hundreds of people. You see, it's insurgent, insurgency, you know, it doesn't mean you're automatically the bad guy. Because depends on who it's against. Because you call called an insurgent. But what do you call people who are anti-government hate government, have their guns because they're afraid that government's coming after them. What do you call them people? Patriots? Mm -hmm. You certainly don't call them patriots. 
Now, how about that female Paul Revere? Oh, yeah. In April 1877, two years after Lexington, British troops were burning down Danbury, Connecticut, just across the border in Patterson, New York. A militia commander named Ludington, or Ludington, learned of the attack and surmised that his area would be next. So he needed to muster the area's patriot farmers to confront them. Up stepped Sybil, a 16-year-old daughter, volunteering to be the messenger. She saddled a horse, and off she went in the middle of the night in a rainstorm, on unmarked muddy roads, pounding on doors, calling out the area's militia to assemble at Patterson. Sure enough, the farmers rallied and forced the Redcoats to retreat. Sybil rode a hard 40 miles that night, twice as far as Paul Revere. Yet, like the others who rode with Revere. Her remarkable contribution to our dem democratic history remains unknown. While Paul is firmly announced and ensconced in the pantheon of heroes who created America. The end. The end. I want to salute uh, of course, may she rest in peace. Uh, the uh, she was 16 years old when she did this. Uh, Sybil from uh, uh, Revolutionary War times, who was the real hero, the real Paul well, Revere, there were not more. Paul Revere. Yeah, there were more Paul Revere. There were, the there were, yeah, there were. It yeah. wasn't just wasn't, Paul Revere. Yeah, one it, man. Yeah, it one was, man against the machine. It was that goofball uh, writer uh, Longfellow that that Henry made Henry Wadsworth Long that made Paul Revere the hero. The hero, seeming like only he was the one that rode around to warn the colonists. Yeah, it or that was Napoleon it. won all of his victories, or that this king yeah. uh, won all of his victories, or that king won all of his victories. Yeah, but Sybil ad infinitum. Sybil rode the farthest. Yes, she did. She rode further than Paul Revere. In the rain. In a rainstorm. Now, you know what story really impressed the hell out of me uh, involving Revolutionary War times? The when the Appalachian settlers beat the crap out of the British army. The, the British Army wanted to go farther west and uh, invade Appalachia and those hillbillies out there. They, you know, they fought like the Indians, like it's guerrilla warfare. Yeah, they stood behind a tree. They were sure. behind, and they were all forests. They were behind trees or up in trees or anywhere they wanted to be, behind bushes, and they all, I guess, fired at will. Right. And uh, and the British, they have to be out in the open. British kept the coming. And not many, wasn't I as many as it was a while ago. Well, they marched in formation in form out in yeah. the open like the Romans did. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, different. Yeah, but uh, the, 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 the ones that fought the Romans didn't have guns. They yeah, didn't have guns. The Romans Or they had to mow them down, baby. The Romans were not up against any army with firearms. <laughs> you know, and the worst was archers, but, you know, the Romans had the... They formed a. Uh, they had a formation called the testuda, means tortoise, and they had these um, the re front, yeah. rectangular curved shields that the men, in the you know the men on the outside, of course, had the shields facing out, and the and the other Romans and inside the formation lifted the shields above, as to form like a tortoise shell, mm. and you know. Or the arrows. So the arrows wouldn't. And the Greeks had the flying wedge. Pen penetrate. And they had the pike. The pike. Well, the pikes were out the front. They didn't bolt. Yeah, the, pi the pike because it was an extra long yeah. spear. <laughs> and they kept on marching. Yeah, they, they didn't throw it. They just simply well, no, push, right push. Through, yeah, they, they just push right through. But um, 
you know, uh, the Appalachians, they uh, used uh, guerrilla warfare, which I assume they learned from the Native Americans, and uh, they beat the British. Anyway, what time do we have? We well, have time for this one here, that's for sure. Okay, go ahead. Thank God for Congress, right? Huh. When things get out of uh, balance in America, we can always count on our legislative stalwarts to recalibrate the scales of justice, right? Yeah. Take greed, for example. The Wall Street barons wrecked our real economy while pushing Washington to let them keep their public subsidies, fat bonuses, and special low tax rates. So our Congress critters turned their legislative guns on avarice. Unfortunately, their aim was a little off. Instead of popping, popping, excuse me, instead of popping the overprivileged, Congress hit the most unprivileged Americans, people on food stamps. Yeah, those were the scapegoats. Too many families are getting food stamps, they shriek, driving the cost of this poverty program to record levels. Hey, knuckleheads! Record numbers of our people are on food stamps today because, guess what? Record numbers of them are unemployed or underemployed. And the jobs are not out there. And, not to mention all the trillions of dollars of welfare for the rich, with bailouts, Wall Street bailouts. Yet the Tea Party, Republicans, now ruling the U.S. House of Representatives, are demanding cuts of as much as $25 billion a year in the food stamp benefits, which would prevent some 13 million Americans, half of them children, from receiving the program's groceries. Well, Representative Michelle Bachman rose to a biblical falsetto. You mean bubble-headed Bachman got all uh, dramatic? To rationalize this. Rationalize? She said, If anyone, if anyone will not work, neither should he eat. Oh, Hello? Yeah. Is that really in the Bible? If you don't work, you don't eat? Yes, it is. But it doesn't mean, you got to look at the context. The context was that if you don't do the work of God, you don't eat. See, they turn it's it around and, and say, if you don't do the work of some corporation, exactly. some company, you don't need, you see, exactly. there's a big difference between doing the work of God and doing the work for some company. Yeah, it involved the, the context when Paul stated it, he was talking about people in the church who won't do the work. They won't, you know, talk about uh, God and this, that, and the other, yeah. they may be afraid, or whatever the hell it is. But that's what he was talking about. He was not talking about privatized work institutions or whatever. Uh, do you see how they twist and distort the Bible? These conservatives? Well, how the hell do you think these prosperity preachers get away with their shit? They twist, they twist and... twist and rest the Bible. Yeah, twist and distort, yeah. And then they say, it's there, it's yet. I'll find it for you. Uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And, 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 and what we were talking about Wednesday, I'm still waiting. And you will still be waiting. But I won't forget. From now until Tuesday. But forget. I won't forget. <laughs> yeah. That's not quite what Jesus said. Also, many are working but not paid enough to make ends meet. More are desperately seeking jobs that aren't there. In fairness, though, the GOP did vote to give these food stamp applicants something. Drug tests. <laughs> I don't recall that Jesus at the Sea of Galilee required anyone to pee in a cup before getting the fishes and loaves of bread. That's true. That he gave to them freely. Freely after miracleizing them freely with no with no with no loans or expecting to be paid back with interest and they didn't work for it and they didn't work for it 
And if he had done so, he would have required the bankers to take the first P in the cups. That's Thank right. you very much. Thank you very much. The end. Now, did you know, before we take our break, did you know, know that nothing. South Carolina wants to make homelessness illegal? <laughs> now, remember, I know, I think I know why the Republicans of South Carolina want to want to implement something ridiculous like this. <laughs> so they can get the homeless into privatized prisons so they can work for free and they can get free slave labor. That's my take on Remember, it. What do you think? South Carolina was the first colony to, let's say, instigate the Civil War. Fort Sumter? Okay, the South Battle Carolina. Of, the Battle of Fort Sumter. Loves their slavery. Even today. Okay? Well, I mean, the homeless, so they're what they're doing is they're they want to punish the homeless for being homeless because they think the homeless are homeless by choice. Not well, by, you know, circumstances created by the government. The Something system. is going on in Texas right now involving the XL pipeline. Oh, yeah? Coming down from Canada, Trans-Canada Pipeline. And uh, the pipeline wants to have an easement in this particular farmer's, this female farmer's land. And she don't want to. Really? So they get the, the government, the state or, or county or whatever city they're going through, and they claim, and all they have to do is check a checkbox on mm -hmm. a piece of paper, mm -hmm. that they are a, 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 a public uh, whatever, a community or whatever, and they can get eminent domain to take over the land really? of that poor farmer huh. and put their stinking pipeline. Steal together. the land. Yes. That's what they do because they have the power. They have the lawyers. They have the money. As I said, there is no justice if courts are not free. Yeah, it's true. All right, we're going to take a break now. It's time for the uh, Reverend Dr. William J. Eisenman's gastronomic delight known as lunch. And we will be back in a little bit with the one and only William H. Morrow III. I, I believe he's calling at, 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 at 3.10 p.m. 3, 10 p.m. and he will talk for 20 minutes. I won't interrupt him too much. <laughs> no pun intended. Well, he better have some good things. Oh, no, no. He's going to come prepared and, right. and he's going to have the flow, otherwise known as the floor. Okay. That's Louisiana talk, right, Luke? Yes. The, the flow? Po-fo, po-po-boy sandwich? Po-boy. 